All right, welcome to the show. This is my YouTube channel, in case you stumbled on here accidentally. Uh, otherwise, you probably have been here before and you know the rules. We're basically going to hang out for an hour, have some guests. We get to talk about your questions, so we'll pick them out of the chat when we get to them. And if you're not watching this live, show up on Thursdays and we'll do this again. My name's Brett, and I will be your hopefully useful host today for a fantastic panel. We've got, uh, so on, I'm on this side, we've got Kelsey Hightower in the middle, and we've got Jerome Pedazzoni. And let me just tell you a little bit about these two gentlemen. Uh, Kelsey is a technologist just trying to keep up with it all. That's his tagline. But he's a principal developer advocate at Google, and you've probably seen him around the internet talking about Kubernetes. And then we have Jerome, who is a tinkerer extraordinaire at a tiny sh at Tiny Shell Script is that the is that Tiny That's Shell the Script name of the company? Yeah. <laughs> That's an awesome company name. Uh, and he was part of the team that built, scaled, and operated Dot Cloud before it became Docker. In case you've been around a while, and he worked seven years at the container startup, and now uh, we countless hats, and now he's doing Kubernetes training full time and just having fun. So thank you two guys for being on the show today. Awesome, happy to be here. Thanks for uh, having us. All right, so if you've been on this, if you've seen this show before, we have zero format, uh, but we do focus on containers and DevOps. We just don't have a script. So um, like any good show, let's start it off with talking about what happened this last couple of weeks. So Kelsey was did a keynote at KubeCon, and in fact, I'll probably pull that up in a minute. But uh, could you, uh, for those that didn't get to go to KubeCon or see all the news about it, could you summarize what that was about and what you were doing yeah. there? Yeah, so I've been in the Kubernetes community for a long time. Uh, I remember the very first KubeCon, was able to MC, give a lot of the keynotes and kind of lead the community uh, with that first gathering. And all the KubeCons leading up to the last one, this one in San Diego in 2019, 12,000 people, uh, I wanted to just do something different. Normally I do these live demos, Normally, I do this deep technical, you know, talks that talk about, you know, where we are and where we're going. So this year, I decided to just drop all the demos, drop all the scripts, drop all the slides, and just kind of have this kind of heart to heart with the community, right? Just talk about why we do what we do, uh, what does it mean to be represented in tech, and how to really think about the way we treat each other, not just gathering and trying to one up each other in terms of contributions to these various projects that you see in the CNCF. So it's the first time I was able to go completely, you know, unscripted live on stage and just really have this kind of very organic talk with the audience. Yeah, and I think it definitely resonated with everyone. So wait, you didn't plan that music stopped part because that was cool. <laughs> so the music stopped part. So in the beginning of the keynote uh, during rehearsals, they have the walk on music. And I wanted to tell this story about the very first Kubernetes gathering where my live demo broke and I had to recover. So while we're doing rehearsals, I asked them to, the day before, I asked them to leave the music on, but just drop it at half volume. Yeah. And they needed a keyword to know when to shut it off. And I was like, I literally heard the music stop when my demo crashed. And then they just cut the music. And that just really brought like this drop dead silence to the kind of uh, the room there. And I think that was like a perfect touch to kick off the talk. That was pretty cool. I actually thought that they were messing up because you, know, you kept talking. I'm like, do they know the music's still on? <laughs> it was yeah, perfect. We just added something new. Yeah, and it turned out well. Yeah, yeah. And um, I think we were talking earlier, uh, Jerome, did the two of you meet at KubeCon? Uh, when did you all meet? No, I, I think, if I remember correctly, we might have met the first time at OSCon, maybe in 2014, 15, something like that. Somehow, like I feel like the, the first time we met was probably in Portland. Um, that I So... Maybe even before Kubernetes swarm orchestration was really a thing from what I can remember. I'm I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I, I pinned that like way back. Yeah. Well, it, it was definitely doing the container wars, right? So there's a period of my <laughs> tech career that I termed the container wars, right? And this is when CoreOS, Docker, uh, Google comes in a little later with Kubernetes. And there's just all of this action and excitement around the container formats, all of this innovation was coming out. And I can remember Jerome being one of the, you know, more friendly participants, even though we worked at different companies. Yeah. We, we kind of saw the world as, look, there's going to be lots of tools coming out. 
me and him had very similar ideas that our number one job was to educate people on what was available. So we kind of crossed path with that kind of mindset. And I think we kind of, you know, had a mutual kind of relationship going forward that it's just technology at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's always like to the sign to me of a, of a quality conference when you walk in and you don't, you don't feel that uh, a vendor association so much as you feel it's just a one big community because we're all moving around and we're all using the same tools. So, yeah. Cool. Um, a- so after that keynote, because I remember for a couple of years, did you take a break from doing the, the headline stuff because you wanted to go back to doing stuff for a living instead of talking about doing stuff? Yeah. So I think a lot of the keynotes are, they're usually time with things that I'm working on. I just want to go and talk about them. Uh, but it got to some point where you're just getting all this advice. I'm pretty sure Jerome can attest to this. It's everyone wants you to speak at their event and you end up doing 50 of these things in one year. And at some point, you get tired of hearing yourself. Yeah. So I stepped back and just said, hey, keynotes only. And then that got crazy. And then I just started to fall back and just kind of focus on maybe some key events and maybe the smaller meetups. But yeah, the goal has been, you know, cut back and, until I have something to talk about. Yeah. Well, okay, so that leads us to a couple of days ago where you throw out a tweet that um, I don't actually have it pulled up, but you said, hey, if you've got a podcast or and it's dope uh, and you want to talk about Kubernetes, I'll be on it. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. I, I've, I've done a few of them and it's surprising that they're all different, right? So it kind of reminds me that you know most podcasts take the character of the host and they kind of draw out a different conversation. And the whole point behind that tweet was most people say, hey, they wish I would write a blog post, but I'm lazy. But I found coming on people's podcasts where they do all the work all the editing, and I get just get to talk about some of those tweets in more detail. Yeah. It's much easier for me to pull off. Yeah, um, I, yeah. From a lot of us, I think blogging is hard. I, I can I can talk for three hours, but writing a one blog post takes a week. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so the because uh, well, we got all these other great shows and stuff out there. So if you're you've already been on Arrested DevOps, which is a fantastic show, I've been a huge fan of Bridget and that whole community for years. Um, and they're obviously you're probably going to be on the Kubernetes podcast, an excellent podcast from Google. So if you're watching this show and you're a podcaster, like go check those shows out, download those podcasts. We have this as a podcast in case you can't watch it on YouTube. Um, but there's so there's more content out there than you could possibly listen to. And for some of us, uh, like Kelsey, uh, actually all three of us, I think we all work from home. So the problem for us is I used to try, I used to listen to podcasts while I commute. <laughs> and when you don't commute, you don't have a lot of time to, you don't make a lot of time to listen to podcasts. So, um, all right, let's talk about what your tweet was about. The, the sort of the future of Kubernetes, you know, how it might, may or may not be relevant. You may or may not be using it. Um, what's that all about? Yes, I think the relevant part starts to get emotional for people, right? There are a lot of people like, you all are doc- Docker captains. And I think what happens is, I'm not saying it to you, it literally, but people get their identities attached to these movements. Yeah. I am a Kubernetes sysadmin. I am a certified Kubernetes engineer. And when that happens, we tend to think about ourselves and our own career growth linked to these technologies. So if I say something like Kubernetes will disappear and it's a good thing, a lot of times what you end up with is people believing that their careers will also disappear. And they can't reconcile that one, at least not immediately when they see a statement like that. So what do I mean is that most technology gets really, really good when we don't see it, right? Like most people use the internet, don't know anything about TCP. The people who are using the cloud for the most part, they don't know much about the hypervisors that the major cloud providers have, right? You just click a button, use an API, and you get a virtual machine. Now, the thing about Kubernetes, it's awesome. We love the API. We like its composability. We like the way we extend it. But the number one pain point that you hear five, six years later is cluster management is hard, right? There's no way to make cluster management easy. It's a full distributed system. Complexity needs to live somewhere. And the thing is, some people just don't benefit from the other things Kubernetes has to offer because they're fearful of the cluster management part. Yeah. And that, and that's, you know, I think when it was new, and I think it's still relevant today, was we talk a lot about that. I mean, the, Jerome and I just launched a course that talks so much about 
the you know the management of the cluster, the building of the cluster. Um, when ironically, at the end of the day, anybody who I talk to as a potential client, it's like, how can I get you out of the job of dealing with Kubernetes? And at worst, you have to just write YAML, <laughs> you know. Um, and I feel like, do you do you feel like there's uh, that next abstraction that we all keep talking about or waiting for? Do you do you see patterns? Is serverless that pattern? Is there another pattern on top of that that will keep us from talking about Kubernetes as the thing that we're deploying to? So for you've been in this game for a while, and so have I. And I think the goal 10, 15 years ago was someone checks in code, it gets deployed to the right place. That's it. That's been the ultimate workflow that everyone has been after. Someone asks for a change, either that's a ticketing system, you yell across the room, it doesn't matter. And someone says, hey, this version of something is ready to go. And there may be 500 versions of something ready to go across an organization. And the goal has been to, once you get that request, that things should just flow to that target. Whether that's Lambda, Kubernetes, VMware, none of that actually matters, right? The whole point was that you had some interface that was closer to the request that hooked into the machinery that got the thing running. So I think for a lot of years, we've always been leaking the details, right? When VMs were hot, everyone was running around with Vagrant. When config management was hot, people were running around with Puppet, Chef, and Ansible on their laptops. When Docker was hot, everyone put Docker on their laptops. Now we see people with Minikube on their laptop. In those cases, I think we're just kind of leaking infrastructure a little too much and not thinking about the actual workflows that allow someone to say, hey, I have an app that's ready to go or ready to test. There should be some high-level interface that has really nothing to do with the Kubernetes API or some serverless API. There's a set of configuration tools at the very top that say, hey, I need this with these settings, these security settings to be running in this environment. And that's something I think that's going to be uniform and independent of the infrastructure underneath. Yeah. Um, Jerome, you do workshops on Kubernetes around the world. Do you do you see people, uh, I mean, obviously people are coming in to learn Kubernetes a lot of times, but do you see this stuff where people are looking at the stuff on top of Kubernetes already or trying to get out of Kubernetes in terms of um, managing it and all that? Well, yes and no. I would say not in my workshops because precisely I'm, I'm trying to offer the kind of workshop for the people who want to know how that thing works behind the scenes, under the hood, you know, because I, I definitely agree that um, Kubernetes, Docker, like all these things need to become invisible. Um, and it's kind of going in circles, like uh, almost, what, 10 years ago when, when I started like the dot .cloud adventure, we were basically trying to copy Heroku because Heroku was and still is magical you just have this code and you get push and it gets deployed and that's all you have to do end of the story it's like it doesn't get simpler than that like um so we were trying to copy that and but not just for ruby but you know like for python and also you can have like mysql and postgres and mongo and all, all the stacks all the things you want instead of just being like it's ruby and postgres and so it platform as a service like this whole idea like Heroku.cloud, what was there in AppFog, et cetera. Like all, all these things, um, they seem less fashionable these days, but um, in my in my heart, like serverless is all about that. Like the, it's not just I'm pushing a function because there are not many applications that you can reduce to a single function or, or lambda. Or, uh, but the idea is this is my code, just run my code and, and don't bother me with... Uh, containers and clusters and, and all that stuff. So I agree that we need to make these things disappear. And at the same time, we, we need some folks to uh, to to understand how how things work to to provide the platform for others. Um, I we we were uh, talking earlier, and I remember like uh, KLC yesterday. You, you I, I saw like a, a part of your arrested DevOps podcast with uh, Bridget Cromhout. And uh, I remember how you explained that, yeah, the, the internet is great because it, it's making itself invisible. And now we, we can just like stream content from our phones and everything. And um, I was thinking, yes. And at the same time, um, we need some folks to operate that even 
in our own homes. Like for instance, I I happen to stay at a place now that is um, big enough that you know you need like a second access point. So you need somebody in your house to understand how that works and actually do that. Like put that access point and that Wi-Fi extender and whatnot so that everybody else in the house can have um, good internet. Um, so we we need some folks to uh, to understand how containers, Kubernetes servers, etc., works. And I don't know what's the what's the ratio. Like you know, like do we need like one platform engineer for what ten developers? Is it one for one thousand? Is it one out of three or four? Um, I I, I don't know, and I guess it depends on what we deploy and it depends what what's the size of the team, etc. Um, so that that's the people that I target in my workshops. Like, okay, you want to know how today it's Kubernetes, yesterday it was Docker, tomorrow it might be something else. You want to know how that thing works? All right, I'm going to uh, we're going to sit together and we're going to you know disassemble that thing and then reassemble it and try to understand how it works so that the end you can go back to your teams um, and and you can help them, you can empower them uh, to use that technology without having to think uh, too much about it. Yeah, the um, the the process there. It's funny when this started. When this all started, like let's go back to that container war topic for a second. Um, I, I always like competition, and as someone who's tries to stay agnostic, even though we're all fans of certain technologies that we find useful, right? Uh, always trying to stand in that uh, middle ground and not uh, be the middle of a be in the middle of the different vendors. What at first, I was like, okay, this is healthy. We've got all these container orchestrators. We've got these different ideas of what a container are. But as the standards started to happen, it made more sense that, okay, now we've got this OCI. Now we, you know, we've got these different... Because we had, like we were mentioning earlier, we have all these other standards that we're all depending on every day anyway. We have the, you know, we have the Linux kernel, the Windows kernel, the TCP IP. We have all these fundamentals that we had to commit to. But for decades now, we've never really moved above the OS in terms of a universal standard for how we get code on a server to users. And uh, as Kubernetes has started to mature, I, I started to wonder and come around the idea of like, you know, is a product in Kubernetes going to end up being that next layer that we can all rely on? And it becomes the whole, you know, question around like is kubernetes universal does everyone need it but what if do you see a pattern kelsey where even things that aren't necessarily running kubernetes could use that same type of application description or that same pattern so that we could all rely and depend on one thing regardless of what the label is on it or is that just is that just kubernetes distributions is that what we're talking about there if we stretch out the timeline much further going back to mainframe and then maybe another 20 years into the future I think we're going to remember this phase of that timeline as the phase where we freed people from the machine. So Kubernetes' temporary role in this whole thing will be that it freed you from the machine. Stop thinking about that server and that one over there. The scheduler has a large part to do with it and that API that lets you describe what you want and allow the rest of the machinery to tie it together. So I think if Kubernetes implementation, right, the current implementation has nodes and run C and container D and firecracker, that's an implementation detail. And we're starting to see that kind of get broken up as well. But the big takeaway, I think, from this small period in the timeline is that we got people off of the Linux server as the primary target. We're not running scripts. We're not running config management code directly on servers. We now have one layer up that we're targeting and allowing the machine to do the work. So I think that sets the stage. And we also expanded the number of workloads that we can do that for. So I think Heroku and maybe function platforms, it's a very narrow scope of workloads that you can do that for. Kubernetes came in and said, hey, what if we expand this idea to even things like databases, message queues, and so forth, even things that need GPUs? Now that we've defined that, now what we can do is say, maybe we can collapse those layers underneath over time. So who will do it? Not sure. What will that product be called? Not sure. But I think the thing that will stick is this style of declarative APIs that you submit to some system, describe what you want, and it will pair your workload with those requirements. Yeah. 
Um, so when we when we go back to con like configuration management, it's it's interesting that if you go back not ten nine years, so when AWS was out, and I was at like Microsoft's conference, Microsoft conference with you know fifteen twenty thousand people when they announced Azure, and if I remember correctly, they didn't have the idea of an, a machine at launch. They had like we have some services. We have uh, like websites. You can make websites, and it's like the I remember that the the er, everyone was internet angry over the fact that they couldn't they didn't see their AC two instance <laughs> when when they the, those services. And I actually thought it was really interesting um, because it it did remove that level of abstraction, but then they ended up having to sort of backfill it and put in their own way to do nodes. And maybe they already had that plan all along, but they just didn't want to launch with it. But Google went through the same journey, right? So yeah. Google started with App Engine and had to go backwards because there is a right now market. Yeah. The right now market wants something that looks very familiar. We made the cloud VPCs look like the way you do networking on-prem. We do all of these things to try to make it familiar because you need to address the right now market. And that's pragmatic and that's very realistic. But the thing is, evolution won't stop for the right now market. So I'm not saying all of this stuff is going to be usable yeah. by everyone that's focused on the right now. Is that that someone has to be responsible for pushing it things forward. So think about mobile. If mobile would have did the right now thing, then we would have put Puppet Chef on our iPhones and then try to do configuration management instead of app stores. Right. Yeah. That would be, oh, let's just automate it and DevOps the mobile space. That doesn't make any sense. So I'm very glad that the mobile space decided to do something different, yeah. not try to inherit the tools of today. Instead, they pushed the boundaries. And I think now we're starting to look at that model for even general compute. That's a good point. I actually do think I had one of those uh, right now mo mobile phones. It was Windows CE. <laughs> and it had a start button on it. <laughs> it was awesome. Well, you, remember, you remember like the trio used to go to Office Depot and buy a cartridge and put it in the phone so you can install the app. Yep. Right? Like that was like, okay, it's better than a floppy disk on the phone. <laughs> but we don't, we don't, we don't, we can move past that a little bit. Yeah, true. Does that take us to uh, Cloud Run? Because that, I got excited about Cloud Run. Um, so for those of that are, are not aware, you can probably describe it much more accurately, but it's like serverless plus the ability to run standard containers in a sort of a one shot deal. Yeah, so Cloud Run is kind of a, if you think about it, so this is kind of from the App Engine team. And one thing we realized with Kubernetes success is that the container, and I think Docker really proved this out well, the container being the unit of packaging an application is a great place to start with the platform, right? Build packs are still cool. You know, managed language runtimes like we saw with build packs in Heroku and early days of App Engine. But what we're seeing now is like people already have tooling for packaging and creating their apps. So with Cloud Run and saying, let's build on top of Kube API. So Knative is the open source backing for Cloud Run. But people are, that are not quite interested in managing an entire Kubernetes cluster and they just want to run their workload, then the Cloud Run product is really saying, hey, give me your container and I'll just run it for you, right? But so that's just kind of an evolution of, in some ways, App Engine kind of meeting the market where it is now and in some ways evolving Kubernetes with one opinion. But I want to be careful here. In that future that we're describing, there will be hundreds of these platforms. There'll be one for mobile, there'll be one for general compute, there'll be one for databases, there'll be one for CDNs. The thing you see Web uh, Cloudflare doing with their kind of uh, workers yeah. service platform where you're pushing your workload to the edge. So it's not going to be just one golden thing that we all just use is this going to be hyper specialized platforms that you deploy your code to yeah and th how does that um so for those that are like learning kubernetes now because we've probably got some people on the uh in the comments that they uh we, we actually, we were all writing, a lot of us were writing our KubeCon uh, last minute <laughs> CFPs last night. It, for me, it was three in the morning. I hit, it, I hit submit 15 minutes before, but I, I, I came up with a last minute one where it was about like, uh, we're sh all the cloud, you know, with, with AWS now announcing that ContainerD is their, their runtime. We've now got 
this scenario where the last five years we have convinced a, 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 mar a large part of the market that they need to learn Docker. And then we're telling them that, oh, now you, well, and it's not that much different, but you know, it's, it's not the same name. Uh, that, that they're going to learn Kubernetes, but Kubernetes no longer runs on Docker in the cloud. And I realized maybe there's a talk there on getting people from Docker to container D and understanding the nuances of that as a way to educate them on what a runtime is. Because we started, we didn't really use the word runtime, I feel like, five years ago. Everybody was just saying Docker containers and containers and not really describing because we didn't, we didn't have a, you know, multiple runtimes that were well known. So uh, for those that are learning Kubernetes now and thinking that that is the thing they're going to do, do you have any sort of advice for this eventual, <laughs> like how, how do they not leave this and rage quit the table flip the internet? So what worked for me is when I finally understood the fundamentals. Right, the fundamentals, for example, let's talk about the scheduler. So what were we doing before scheduler? Some people don't have a scheduler now. Some people aren't using Docker Swarm, Mesos, Nomad, or Kubernetes. And I think back to my job back then was like, oh, you get a spreadsheet, you put all the nodes in your infrastructure on the spreadsheet, and then you're the scheduler. You're in the meat cloud. You, the human being, is deciding what workloads go on what machines. And if you think deeply about the process, you know what the inventory of machines are, you know what's running on those machines, and you're now kind of processing the predicates of the request. So this new app needs to run on machine 3A Optimus Prime 46. And now you're being a scheduler. So when I see Kubernetes come out, or Nomad or Swarm, I know the fundamentals are the same. There is something that's going to need some input. It's going to have to have some inventory of the fleet. And it's going to have to do a matchmaking the same way I used to do. And this is why I can explain these things with analogies like playing Tetris, for example, because it resonates with people. So if people want to stay in the know, just think about the fundamentals. We're going to take a package in a tarball. Before Docker, we were doing this with RPMs and CPIO. So before Docker registries, we were using Yum repositories. The fundamentals are the same. Package a thing, put it in a repository, pull the thing down, and run it. So Docker is one way of doing it. Container D is another way of doing it. They have different APIs, but the fundamentals are roughly the same. So I think a lot of times when we see these transitions, it's largely driven by either your provider has chosen Container D for some reason, and you're just going to use it by default, because that is not the goal of Kubernetes or ECS or any of these platforms. The goal is to take your workload and run it in the most efficient way possible. So if you want to understand why the C change between Docker or Container D, if you go higher up the stack, you'll see what the demands are from the thing above. And then, like I said earlier, you can start collapsing the things underneath when the requirements above change. Right. Yeah, I, I agree like 200% on that, like on a, on a tactical level, for instance, um, when, I, when I show Kubernetes, um, often I start, I start with a compose file and I say, okay, this is the only thing we're going to use Docker. Everything after that, you're not going to see me use one single Docker command because the container engine that you use is irrelevant. The Kubernetes API is going to abstract everything. Could be Docker, could be ContainerD, could be Rocket, could be Cryo, could be Nabla, Fracti, like et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter. Everything that I'm showing you today will work exactly the, the same way on every single Kubernetes cluster. So don't don't freak out because everybody is like, oh, now we're using ContainerD or this or that. It's, um, it's totally fine. Uh, now on a kind of strategic level, like um, my... A personal experience that I had, like when I when I finally had to start learning Kubernetes for real, like not just to talk about it, but actually deploy some stuff on it. I had been using Swarm for a while, and I was like, "Wow, everybody's telling me that Kubernetes is complicated." So I was kind of bracing, you know, like for for impact. And then I realized, no, that that stuff is just pretty much exactly the same. We have. We don't have the same words, you know, we have like services here, deployments there, we have this and that, uh, we have managers, we have a control plane, we have 
but it's the same concepts. Um, it's, you know, it's a little bit like when you learn Italian and French and then you need to pick up Spanish or the other way around. It's like there are so many things that work the same way. Um, some, some, some words are going to be different, uh, but you're not completely lost. And I felt like, I felt like why people are saying that this is complicated. It's, it's not that complicated. Like the, the overall concepts are exactly the same, um, but we are just automating um, everything like one step further. Uh, the, the thing Kelsey said about like uh, scheduling really resonated to me because it's, uh, it's, it's exactly that. Like um, if I have five servers um, in, a, in a colo or in a closet somewhere and I need to orchestrate VMs, like, you know, like every week somebody is going to my desk and is telling me, hey, I need a VM for that application or that's fine, that's easy. And yeah, I, I can do that with a, with a spreadsheet. Now, if it's if if my little organization grew a little bit, you know, and instead of five servers, I have five data centers or five clouds or five whatever, and I have thousands of machines. And instead of being once a week, it's every day I have teams lining up like uh, outside my desk and telling me, hey, I need like 50 VMs like this and also 20 with like SSDs and I need um, 80 with like GPUs, etc then I, I can't do it by hand anymore. It just doesn't work. Like it's algorithmically, this is super complicated. Like there are tons of research papers written on, on that kind of class of problem. And that's when we need a real scheduler. And now I think that when we, when we are doing the switch from VMs to containers, um, instead of having some amount of VMs, doesn't matter, like put, put the number you want here. Now you have maybe 10x or 100x the number of containers. So the big problem that seemed very abstract before, like, yeah, who has 5,000 VMs really? Um, now it turns into who has thousands of containers? Well, maybe you do. Maybe many of you in watching this uh, will soon have hundreds or thousands of containers, uh, precisely because we made containers to be really um, like um, a small unit of deployment that is easy to, it's easy to start more containers. Like, you know, when we do the Docker demos, it's like Docker run, Docker run, Docker run, boom, you got three containers. Um, so um, since we have so many containers, we need an actual scheduler. And that's where something like Kubernetes kicks in and makes that kind of reachable and, and, and easy to use. Um, so to, to, to go back to the initial question, which was about, okay, should we, you know, like, should we freak out because everybody is moving to container or whatever? Uh, the, that to me, the answer is no. It's like for, for, for most of us, um, container D is already invisible. Um, it's, it's, it's already kind of uh, abstracted by the API. And then some of us um, need to know, as I was saying earlier, like how that stuff really works because when we are going to operate that thing, uh, we need to know what are the failure modes and uh, what do I do when this specific error happens, what are the limits. Um, and, and, and so, so there is a, a big interest into that kind of technology for, I would say, builders and operators. Um, but if I'm a developer um, trying to develop my Rails Django or Node app, um, I don't need to worry about container D. And I, I, I can if I want because I, you know, like if I want to know how things work behind the scenes, but I sh shouldn't really have to think about it. Yeah, um, I, I, I like those answers. I like that we are not... I mean, yes, we have serverless for greenfield applications, and we can write functions uh, in that model. But I like that we're sticking with the container model just because we've got 30 years of apps that we still have to run <laughs> and and all these new ideas that we keep coming out with on uh, on all the different platforms about how to run uh, sort of greenfield apps, which I, was what I would classify as the serverless space where you have to rewrite stuff or just write a new app or whatever. And... The, um, you know, I always, whenever I'm doing my Docker 101 talks, I always talk about, you know, I, I had, I did have a client that showed up that had a, a PHP 4.2, you know, like a 10, 10 to 15 year old app. And I didn't have to change anything to run it in a container. And that would allow us to modernize our infrastructure. Cause when you're on the ops side of things, one of your big challenges in the, in the legacy space is like, 
I got all these old servers. I got to rotate them out. But people don't like downtime. But they didn't design distributed apps. So everything's frozen and we can't touch it. It's, it's too big to fail, too important to ignore, I think is the kind of... Yeah, and I think also there's a piece there where if we remove the concept of age of an app, right? Because I don't think that really matters or should dictate the platform or the yeah. way it's managed. I think we think about a functions as a service platform. You're really kind of buying into this idea that there's some SDK that you're just going to slot into and it will send you traffic using the SDK. It reminds me a lot of JBoss back in the day. You drop your war file and it just kind of did all this magic around you. So we're kind of used to that. Yeah. XINETD, CGI, there's plenty of those kind of ideas that we've seen come and go. Uh, and then there's also this idea that if I'm using HTTP and I want a lot of control over that process and how I handle that request, then you're going to probably want a platform that allows you to bind to the socket and handle HTTP requests yourself. Some people are doing WebSockets, some people are doing gRPC. That protocol level shouldn't dictate, do I have to manage a whole cluster? Right, yeah. That's kind of the goal here, right? No yeah. matter what my protocol I choose to use, I want the option of being able to give you my thing and you run it for me. And if you can't do that to my requirements, I still want the option of running my own cluster or VM or microkernel or whatever makes sense for me. Um, the, the container as the delineation, I think, is... I, I feel like we're going to look back and still think of this as the decade where, and you talk about evolution, right? Because if we were run all long enough, we, I did the mainframe to PC uh, replacements, green screens to mice, uh, essentially, in the 90s. And then we did virtualization, which everyone at the time who wasn't on board with virtualization thought it was crazy and insane and full of security and performance problems. Like, yeah, it was ridiculous. And now it's crazy to think you wouldn't do virtualization by default. And I feel like when we look back, this decade will be the, we created this next DMARC line that from a lot of cases, that can still be the difference between a build document and the Docker file and the uh, the whatever you're going to deploy that on, whether it's Heroku or Kubernetes or Cloud Run, um, that's kind of the stuff. Do you? What do you think, Jerome? Um, yeah, and I that what you said on the virtualization, like it's one of my favorite virtualization stories. Like um, 12 plus years ago, when I was working for this voice over IP company and like physical machines, and I I just had discovered Xen, so I was like, folks. I, I want to move everything to Xen. And they were like, no, 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 no. That's you can't move VOIP to Xen because it's latency sensitive. You had voice packets, that's never gonna work. You can't do that. I'm like, oh, damn. And the developers were telling me, well, it kind of sucks because we have production, we have pre-production, we would like to try some new things, but we can't because we only have that many machines. I'm like, hmm. So one day I came to the developers and I told them, all right, now you have all these environments um, so you can try all your things. And so they asked me, how do you do that? And, well, I, I took the pre-production and I put Xen on that and I put Asterisk and like uh, OpenSIP and all that stuff, all that VoIP stack in, in Xen. And they were like, and, and it works? And like, yeah, it's been working for, for a few weeks now. Uh, and no, nobody noticed because it just works exactly the same way. And I'm like, wow, mind blown. And so I think I've, I've seen similar things with containers where people were like, no, 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 I can't, I can't run that in containers because whatever reasons. And part of one of my favorite hobbies when, when I was kind of doing that at Docker was like, let's see how we can get your stuff in containers anyway. Even though everybody thinks that it's like nonsense and we shouldn't do that, let's try to see how we can do it. Because I think even if, even if maybe it's not a good idea right now, at some point in the long run, it's it's we, we, we should think about it. And I think um, maybe that's why I, I got this kind of silly title like Tinkerer. It's uh, trying to fit these things that don't look like they're going to fit at first. Um, so for instance, um, I want to try to run, you know, like I, I don't know what could come to mind, but this weird thing, let's, let's try to have it run in 
Cloud Run and Heroku and Lambda and whatever else, uh, because I think in 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 the long run, um, some unusual, some interesting patterns are are going to uh, to appear. Like uh, when we did Docker in Docker, for instance, at first there was like a nice joke of like, hey, we we heard you like containers, so now you can run Docker in Docker, so you can containerize what you containerize. But really, the whole point was for the developers of Docker, the engine to be able to work on Docker without having you know, to stop the engine, run the new version, test it, then shut it down, uh, stop the old version again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, now that you have Docker in Docker, okay, you, you don't have to worry about that. And then people started to use it for CI because it's like, hey, I'm, I want to run, let's say Jenkins, but I want to run it in a container, but that container needs to stop more containers. So one of the options was let's run Docker in Docker, which had first uh, was just you know like for internal development we didn't really think about what would be possible with it and then people started to come up with new uses for that so I think um, I that, that's the kind of thing that I find exciting with that with that new stuff it's like hey let's try to do things that it was not really intended for in the first place like things where the people who know are going to shake their heads and be like, nope. Um, but something else will come up from that. Um, I don't know, may maybe somebody will get Firecracker to run in Cloud Run to emulate ARM something so that they can do CI for phones or whatever, you know, like something super weird that uh, we wouldn't think about at first. Um, and but but interesting and unplanned use cases will uh, will crop out from that. Cool. Um, I, I I I always have appreciated your tinkering. So <laughs> I'm keep on tinkering. Um, okay, I'm going to change topics real quick before we get to some questions. Um, since we're talking about future of Kubernetes, one part that's I still feel I don't have a good answer for people on is. What should we be doing locally for development? You know, people seem to want to gravitate to develop on Kubernetes. I'm a big fan of Docker Compose. I felt like that was a good method. But once we start getting into service mesh and all this other stuff, I don't have a clear understanding of how the, the default answer. Obviously, everyone's different. What, what do you What do you guys think? I think I think when it comes to so there's one step here. If, if you have no Docker, you have no Kubernetes, and you're building an application you have a fundamental set of things that you need to do. My application has dependencies. Maybe it's a database, maybe, maybe it's some supporting service. This has always been true if you're doing things that have dependencies. So how do you get the dependencies accessible to you, right? So when internet was slow, you, you try to get everything jammed onto your laptop because you, you don't want to have these barriers, networking, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes you want a clean slate, right? I don't want to use someone else's database because the schema may be different. Either way, this is the total problem is I need dependencies in a way that don't get in my way. That's it. That's the only problem you have. So then people look at Vagrant and said, all right, I'll do it a bunch of VMs because we're using the cloud or virtualization. So maybe I should have a bunch of VMs on my machine. Then Docker comes along. He's like, well, if we're using Docker, then maybe I should have Docker on my machine. Oh, we're using Kubernetes. Maybe I should have Kubernetes. None of that makes any sense. There's a, there's a way that you can probably use Docker to give you all of your dependencies, update the config file of the app that you're actively working on to point to the things running in Docker, and then deploy eventually to Kubernetes. I think people have this belief in their mind that they can make their laptop look like production. They can mimic the VPC settings. They can mimic all the security policies. They can mimic the entire cluster configuration if they can just install the exact same cluster in all of its configs locally. And in my entire career, I've never seen that work. I've never seen someone get the exact kernel version in production, the exact syscall filters in production, the exact sidecars logging, virtual NIC, right? Because these are the things that get in the way at unexpected times. So local development, I like to keep it very simple. If I have dependencies, something that can run those dependencies, whether it's system D or Docker, if I need a database, maybe I have one that's remote and I just use that remote IP address. If I'm using MySQL or Postgres, maybe I have a dedicated database instance that's really, really tiny just for me or just for my team. But either way, I think it's a decoupled problem. Running in Kubernetes at some point down the line 
is different than how I test my dependencies locally. And I think we just conflate the two because we think it's convenient to try to match what's in production. Yeah, and of course we were sold on the uh, the idea of uh, works of my machine no longer being a thing. <laughs> yeah, but it's still a thing. Even without, yeah, even, even without going all the way to, as we were mentioning, like kernels and network specifics, um, like recently I, I was uh, giving a hand to my partner with some Django code and that code uh, was using some external services. And then you're like, okay, as soon as you use any kind of external service, um, you you can't just run locally anymore. I mean, you can't run fully locally anymore. Even if you're running locally without containers, without VMs, without anything, um, if you're using like this external API, like the Google Maps API, etc. well, you're not gonna instantiate Google Maps locally on, on your computer. Um, so the, the it, it becomes an, an illusion, a kind of a, a fallacy to say that you're going to be able to run entirely locally, whether it's containers or et cetera. So once we accept that, it's like, okay, we need something slightly different between that dev environment and that production and everything in between, staging, pre-prod, CI, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, and, and once we accept that, I think it, it becomes a bit easier rather than trying to be like, I'm going to have everything on my laptop because mm -hmm. that that's not possible. That won't work. Yeah. So are we talking about then tools like uh, Scaffold and uh, is it Octeto? I think is how you pronounce it. Um, is so it tools I, like that? My answer is no steel because the fundamentals are, I think yeah. is I don't use containers until the very last mile. Okay. I don't even, why would I package my app? Like when I was using Red Hat, I didn't build an RPM first before I tested my app, right? It doesn't, for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Like to yeah. me, if I have an app, I should be able to build that app locally. If Docker helps you build your app locally, then great. But the result is a binary that listens on some port that has a config file that points to services either locally, remotely, dev environment, doesn't matter. That's my unit of compute. So if these tools help you build your app, great. But I see people building apps that they can't actually use if Docker's not around. You go to GitHub and people are like, hey, here's a Docker file. I'm like, dude, why do I need a Docker file to build your app? Like, this is going too far, in my opinion. I think Docker files are convenient. Hey, yeah. thumbs up. Thanks for doing that. But if I already have like Node.js or Golang installed locally, the last thing I want to do is maybe run your thing in Docker just to build it, right? Like that doesn't make a lot of sense to require such a development environment just for the simplest case of building a binary. Yeah, I have uh, full disclosure. I have a Node.js on in Docker course, and I've often wondered if I should troll my own course with a video at the end that just says, "Or don't." <laughs> yes, do that. <laughs> Now that you've learned eight hours of your, I mean, obviously a lot of it's about production and CI and all that stuff, but it's like, um, uh, there is a point at which I was, I, I was like, I wanted to make, I want to show people the most ultimate Docker, Node.js development environment. We're going to have VS code. We're going to have TypeScript. We're going to have all this stuff. And at some point I was down such a rabbit hole that I, I just couldn't, I just didn't. I, and, and people ask me in the course, they're like, you know, hey, what do you do for this? And I'm like, eh. Now, to, to be clear, I don't I know. Do like the, I do like the fact that Docker does make it easy to partition up our single machine, right? I remember yeah. living in the Python world where once you install dependencies once, you can't use that file system or you had to go to virtual inf or something like that. So I think Docker makes that virtual inf kind of thing at scale really, really nice. So I'm not saying that it has no use, but you got to really ask yourself some questions when you have to start to resort to those kind of things. Maybe your language is tripping you up. Like Go is really nice with the whole module system where I can switch directories and not have this kind of problem. So I think we can push the boundaries there. Yeah, and I, I, do you agree? I, one of the things I tend to tell people around this is, you know, it's a very much an, a language decision because, you know, I work with people that do Ruby and PHP and getting them the right version. Like they end up with learning a bunch of tools around version management on their local machine and breaking, especially Macs are a little like this where you end up breaking the host version and you have to overwrite the host version. And I love to throw in Docker as a solution to that. Um, I don't have anything better to tell them. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think I think it's the perfect universal virtual environment kind of tool. Like it did a valuable job for programming languages. In the Go world, I don't resort to that because 
I think I have a much more native, maybe some intents and purposes better way to let me do that style of development. But I can see Docker being a universal way to do that. Yeah. Um, well, when we talk about microservice development, um, what does that look like locally if you're not doing Docker? Does that mean you're using something remote then? You're using remote dependencies? Because you wouldn't want to spin up a bunch of different microservices, right? But, well, I mean, there was a world before Docker, <laughs> right? Do you guys remember there was a world before Docker? And I remember if you were using JBoss, for example, you could drop a bunch of war files in a single directory, and it will actually start all your services up in the one application container, right? There was an XML file where you said, this service gets this port, this service gets this port. And there's like 60,000 plus ports on your machine. Right. So, right, if you don't have enough memory to run the binary by itself, boy, wait till you try to run Minikube on right. top of that, right? So logically, we've always had a way to run multiple applications on a single machine, right? There's some complications with things like Ruby and Python for sure. But I think we're kind of missing the boat again. Localhost port 8080. Other one, localhost port 8081. The other one, 8082. And then yeah. this app that I'm actively working on, I can just configure it to say, hey, those three are there. You can actually still work on a microservice this way. I think what people are really doing is building distributed monoliths that mm. need 100 little apps just so they can work on one. It's like, wow, man, this looks like a distributed monolith and not really a microservice that you can't actually develop any part of this app without having every other app running first. All right. I just figured out the next two podcasts we have to start. The first one is Meat Cloud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the second one is Distributed Monolith. Uh, I think those will do well. Um, the yeah, I mean, I think I feel like we could talk a whole we could take a whole podcast and talk about local development because I I, I, I don't know what I'm doing and I don't know what to tell other people. And when you start to do a lot of talking to other people, like we all three do, tend to do, they tend to come to you with lots of questions and you hope to have a, some sort of answer. And I, and I, I don't have, I don't have a lot of good answers for everyone specifically. Like they have to, it, it ends up being a very discreet answer to the person and the, the, how, how they're developing, what languages they're using, how many microservices. Yeah. Cool. Jerome, anything on that? Yeah, I think the, the, the things we're going to use for development tools, and as yeah, you, you mentioned a few like uh, scaffold, draft, uh, garden, tilt, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all of these being very container and, and Kubernetes oriented, like the things that we're going to use are going to be a, a reflection on of, the, of, of what we ship it's it's a thing I often mention at the end of training stuff, like I, I especially after you know, like three days going hardcore and I'm like, all right, folks, that was the easy part. Um, so the, the hard part is going to be around like people and culture. Um, so, for instance, what what are you shipping? You know, like what's the delineation uh, before we would say between devs and ops? But if you don't want to make that delineation, let's say there is the build team and there is the run team. You know, it's just like change the language, but it's the same idea. So, what do we ship? Is are you shipping code? If you're just shipping code, then you you, you probably don't need containers because you're not really getting anything out of it. You're just like, you know, throwing the proverbial Table uh, uh, across the, the field. Now, if you're shipping container images, uh, that's great. That that's fantastic. If you're working with Monolith, because now you have this container image and you can just start it and not worry about like the billion dependencies that are in it. Uh, but as soon as you have multiple services, just shipping container images is not enough because you have to explain how they. Um, connect together, like which, as Kelsey was saying, like uh, w which ports are they using? How do you configure all, all these things to talk together? So am I shipping a Compose file? Am I shipping Kubernetes manifest? I, am I shipping a Helm chart, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and that's good. The, the tools that we will pick will reflect um, the, 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 the division of labor in, the, in, a, in our development team. Um, another example is when we are talking about CI and, and CD and how, how we go to production. Like what's what's the thing that makes some code go to production? Is it when I 
merge some peer to master uh, or to production or you know like some special branch okay then it means that my developers are kind of in charge of making something go to production because merging a peer that's typically like something de that developers do is it like do i have a big button somewhere to promote a branch well if i have that maybe with jenkins or whatever then it probably means that the the responsibility of going to production is something taken by maybe you know like more like a management level like it's we're not talking like merging a pr we're talking like more like pushing a button somewhere or do i have maybe something even entirely different. Um, and so de depending on what that procedure looks like, what this go to production looks like, I can tell you like what the organization looks like, what, who does what, or conversely, if you're like, hey, we need to implement continuous deployment, or what, what should we use? Like, like okay, let's, let's look at who's making the decision of going to production right now. And from that, we can infer, all right, I think you want something where you merge a pull request or you push a button or you fill some forms or whatever. And that's that, and the, with that, we can pick the, the right tools to implement that. So same thing for development tools, depending on what we have and what we want to ship, I'm, I'm going to tell you, oh yeah, you maybe you should go with Compose, maybe we should go with um, Customize, maybe you should just stick to something like Heroku or um, or try ECS or Cloud Run, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's why we are consultants. <laughs> it depends <laughs> is the answer to everything. Yep. Um, all right, so, so we're wrapping up the show and I got some questions, rapid fire questions. Um, we'll see if we can nail a couple of these out. Uh, there's a question on, I'll be interested if anyone on the panel can share any shift left pipeline type of efforts, projects, et cetera, that they, are in, or that they see as interesting. I'm just going to throw in there, I like anything that I can put into a Docker file or around that Docker file to scan uh, on every commit, like Trivi is something I just learned about the last couple of months from Aqua Security. That's my, if I had to pick that or sneak on scanning for vulnerabilities and other issues in your, in your uh, code while you're committing. You guys got any any tips, any projects? Fundamentals, right? We've been doing this forever. So what's the fundamentals, right? There's different points you want to scan for issues. Some people have static analysers that can go in a, in a code base and try to look for issues. Some people can look for issues at the dependency level. Some people can look for issues at the binary level, the thing that's compiled before it deploys. Some people can use things like, uh, as part of the deployment process, you have a tool that does some pre-flight checks to make sure a thing is legit before it starts getting traffic, right? Before you attach it to the load balancer, is this thing actually ready to go? And then you have these kind of active scans that say, hey, this thing's been running for a little while. Let me try to do things to it. And if I can, then maybe I send some alerts out. And the last one is, you know, I think containers make this slightly easier. I used to do it with RPMs. You can go and say, is that build still any good? The things it depends on has vulnerabilities, so we need to either shut that down or get it replaced or send out an alert, alerting someone that they need to do those things. So to me, it's it's the exact same fundamental. So if you go and search for the thing you used to do plus container, you're probably going to either find the same vendor or a new vendor attempting to do the same thing we used to do. All right. Um, let's see if there's got another one here. I think we've talked a little bit about this, but what do you think is the next step in the abstraction? Does Do we have an elevator pitch? <laughs> there will be 200 extractions. You're going to pick one. There's not going to be one that unifies us all and we just stop. There's going to be one, and then some people will build new abstractions on top of that one. And in parallel, there'll be another abstraction that if it's good enough, we'll just use it, or we'll do the same thing and build on top of it. But when you stand back, there will be like, hundreds of them and they will all make sense depending where you are on that spectrum all right uh i think this relates to our conversation earlier about old i mentioned old apps going into containers uh the age often is unsecure do you think we should be continuing to promote the promotion of old insecure code into a container Oh man, I, I've heard that one like so many times. Uh, very often, one of the one of the big friction points 
for you know like old style ops folks and they're kind of uh, being like no i don't want to implement containers because i don't want my developers to put their crappy code in containers like you many people are like hey you're just going to tie a nice bow around it and it's in the container and it looks like it's like no n nobody ever said that um the i i think um just like kelsey said like with containers made some things easier for instance the whole vulnerability scanning thing if you if you're using vms and you're telling me hey i have hundreds of vm images and i need to scan them um, I have to think a lot about how I'm going to do that technically. If it's a bunch of AMIs on Amazon or uh, images or on, on, on GCP, et cetera, I'm like, all right, how am I going to do this? You know, like just, just getting the VM image, uh, that's going to be probably a few hours or days of experiments just to, to get the bits somewhere. Now, if it's container image, it is going to be five minutes. Okay, you get the image and that's it. That's that's the file system, end of the story. So containers kind of lower the bar for so many of these problems. Um, so sometimes even getting like old code that we know is it's not it's not nice. Um, we're kind of you know it's it's on live support and uh, but putting that in containers is still going to help us because now if I want to check like if some files have changed in that container, I, should, I can just do a Docker diff or whatever is the equivalent on, on your, the container engine that I use. If I'm on a VM, now I have to install Tripwire or whatever if I want to do the same thing. It, it's just like everything is more complicated. Everything is heavier. Everything takes more time. So I, I would take um, bad code in a container over bad code in a VM any day because at least now it's uh, now I can I, I can manipulate that code um, and and this this application like this container easily with you know like small tools whereas with VMs or physical machines I had to get the power tools to do anything with it so so I would say yeah I, it it still makes sense um, to uh, to put old potentially insecure vulnerable code in containers um, because at least for me but again that comes from someone who's familiar with the container ecosystem and that's going to unlock a whole um, lot of uh, tools and things i can i can use to uh, to manage uh, this application so that that would be my perspective and i, I think there's a thing to add there there's a difference between multi-tenancy co-mingling things for the first time like a lot of people are doing one app to one VM for whatever reason. It could be because of security reasons. Container has nothing to do with that choice. You still can run one app per VM and just leverage the benefits of packaging, scanning, and the regular tools that you get by being able to manage an application in this style. But I can see where people would be hesitant to say, let's take a bunch of unsecure code, throw it in Kubernetes, and really expose how unsecure those things are by commingling things, by opening up the floodgates, not using firewall rules like we used to in static infrastructure. So I think people are kind of coupling, do I use an orchestrator that will just kind of commingle things and highlight my unsecurities? Or do I just stick with the packaging format and just go with one container per machine because I'm not quite ready for multi-tenancy? Yeah, yep. I like that. I like that. And in fact, uh, I think that was actually my first time in containers for the first few years before we all had the orchestrators. A lot of us, we weren't we weren't savvy enough to run a bunch of different containers on the same node and manage them because like a monitoring tools didn't really handle that well. They weren't container aware. So you, a lot of us, I specifically tended to put one container, you know, whatever we did before, it's the same thing now. It's just in a container for deployment velocity. Um I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're bringing that up because that I think that's an underrepresented model for traditional companies that are still getting their feet wet. And um, and the funny thing is that's how the newest container platform, right, Fargate for EKS, works. One pod yeah. per VM. So it's not like it's an old versus new decision. It's a way of getting the isolation that we want. Yeah, and I I, I like that. I like that they have that option because it removes one more argument for those that uh, Jerome was talking about, those those people that are not wanting to move forward 
uh, it removes an argument for why they might want to consider containers as an isolation and deployment mechanism where they would argue that I can't do this because I, I can't isolate. It, it becomes a, it's a nice option. I really like it. So I see it as addressing a valid concern. <laughs> <laughs> well put. And we will leave it there. I'm so glad to have you two on the show. Um, thank you all, everyone, for asking the questions. Hopefully we got to some of your questions in chat and we got some of them live on the show. Um, and again, uh, so Kelsey, Jerome, uh, Kelsey first, tell us, tell us where you're on the internet and how people can reach you. Twitter DMs are open. All right. And you got a Twitter handle down there below. Jerome, how about yourself? Same thing that works. Yeah. So we're a big Twitter family in the container community. So if you're not on Twitter and you are wanting to get into containers or just getting started, definitely come check us all out because a lot of us, um, talk daily on there and help people out. Um, I think that we are all very helpful in a friendly community overall. So check us out there. Um, I'm, I'll take twice as long on Facebook to answer you that I will on Twitter. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much again, you two, for being on the show. And for those of you who this is not your, this is your first time, next week, same time, we'll be doing a live, to, live show here on Thursdays. And we'll see you next time on YouTube Live. Ciao.